Good afternoon, and welcome to today's installment of the 2024 January series. I'm Jesse Holcomb, a professor of journalism and communication here at the university. Would you please take a moment to silence your cell phones? As you're doing so, I would like to welcome guests at all of our remote viewing locations, including Baker Bookhouse, South Windsor, Connecticut, and Mesa, Arizona. And all our virtual attendees across time zones, we're grateful you're joining us today. And now, would you please join me in a word of prayer? God who listens, grant that we may tune our senses to the world around us to hear the still voice within and without. God who speaks and acts in time and space, grant that we may follow the sound of your spirit in the trees and on the water, in the city and amidst the crowds. Ignite in us this hour a passion for paying attention. Amen. And now, I am thrilled to introduce today's speaker, Niall Boudou. Too many journalists by nature or by design spend their days feeding the beast filling pages, websites, airwaves, and platforms with more and more copy. Nyla, a prolific and accomplished journalist in her own right, shows us a different way. You may know Nyla as the voice of Axios, one of the fastest growing global news organizations today. You may also recognize Nyla's voice if you listen to 1A, NPR's flagship daily public affairs program. What sets Nyla apart as such a gifted interviewer is her ability to hear not just what her guests are saying, but also what they're not, and to create opportunities for surprise and complexity in the middle of a conversation. It's a skill well honed through years of reporting at organizations like WBEZ, Illinois Public Media, Reuters, the Associated Press, the Miami Herald, and beyond and perhaps a skill set nurtured during her formative years here at Calvin, where Nyla completed her undergraduate degree. Two concluding notes. Nyla will be available to greet the audience in the West Lobby of the Covenant Fine Arts Center following the presentation. And finally, Calvin University is grateful to a friend of the January series for underwriting today's presentation. Please welcome Nyla Budhu. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so grateful to the Calvin community for extending this invitation to me today. It is truly such an honor. It has been so lovely, actually, since the January series was announced to see how many people reached out to me that I haven't heard from in years. And I think it's just a testament to the power of the Calvin community. I also want to thank all of my family and my extended family and of Calvin people and friends who are here today and watching remotely, especially in Florida. And I want to extend my thanks to Dr. Bohr, to January Series Director Michael Wildscott, and to all the members of the wider Calvin community who made today possible. Institutions of learning are such essential, special places that help nurture not just our hearts, but our minds. And as someone who spends much of my life outside of an academic institution, I just want to acknowledge how important this space is. And as a former CHIME staffer, I would be remiss if I didn't especially thank one part of this Calvin community. That's all of the CHIME staff and its faculty advisor, Professor, Professor Jesse Holcomb, for the role that they play on campus. Jesse, thank you so much for that introduction and that lovely prayer. As Jesse mentioned, although I didn't realize it at the time, my time here on campus and working with Chimes helped create the spiritual foundation for the journalism that I do today. So it's a privilege for me to share some of what I do, how and why, with all of you here at Calvin University. Until I became a trustee, one of my favorite volunteers on campus was actually serving as an informal advisory capacity to the student journalists. So I want to thank them for the important work that they do to shine a light on truth. And I feel like it's especially relevant to point out that this has been an unfortunately deadly year for journalists and the work that we do. In fact, as of yesterday, 83 journalists have been killed since the war in Israel and Hamas began on October 7th. That's according to preliminary investigations by the Committee to Protect Journalists. 
Of course, I'm not saying that those 83 deaths meant any more than the total of the 25,000 casualties that we've seen since this war began less than four months ago. But I think it's really important to note that the journalists who chose to be there, they chose to be there to share with you about what's going on. So if you have read any news stories, watched any video, or listened to any reporting from journalists from that region, these are people who are sharing with the world an independent perspective on what is happening there. And as journalism has increasingly come under attack, not just outside the US, but also within this country, I wanted to acknowledge the very dangerous work that many of my colleagues are doing. So can I ask us to just bow our heads and have a moment of silence to remember and honor those lives? Thank you. It's interesting what a moment of silence does, right? It stills us and it causes us to be in the moment. It's okay if maybe you found it hard to focus on that moment. Uh, I'm hoping that there isn't someone who peeked at their phone or watches during that time, which is a good reminder. Your phones may be on silent, but can I ask if everyone can also just put your phones away for the next 20 minutes? Can you try to not check your phone? Uh, I love how some musicians now, when you go to concerts, make you check your phone in a pouch before you go in. So consider this just like the last place I did that, which is Bruno Mars and his Silk Sonic Vegas residency. Um, please don't check your phones. <laughs> One of my favorite things about guest hosting for public radio is when I go into the studio at WAMU, I don't take my phone. I have two hours of being live on air, engaging in conversations with people without paying attention to that. And it forces me to be present in the moment, to not have distractions. A few weeks ago, I was fortunate enough to have the artist and ballerina Misty Copeland on my show. And I asked her how she prepares for her roles and about what goes through her head when she dances and when she goes on stage. And her response was something that I don't think I'll ever forget. She said that one of the greatest gifts of performing is that it's one of the few times in her life that she can be fully present in her art, in her music, in dancing for that role. And it made me realize that's also one of the greatest gifts of hosting a live radio program, of being fully present when you're in conversation with someone. And that's hard to do. One of the hardest parts about listening is staying present in the moment. I have been a journalist for more than two decades, and about halfway into my career, I also became a trained spiritual director. I don't usually talk about my spiritual direction background as how it relates to journalism, but the spiritual director in me wants to call attention to the fact that quieting our minds is an important step in focusing and helping people to listen. So that's one of my first lessons of listening. You can't truly listen to someone if you're not present in the moment. Well, how can you do that given the amount of distractions that we have on a daily basis? First, I would say it's important just to acknowledge that this is what you want to do. Even if this is hard, or if you fail at what you're hoping for, you should set that intention for yourself and try. Like many other things, staying present in a moment is a skill that you can learn to develop. So as it turns out, is listening. So today, I'm gonna to talk about how you can turn listening into a skill. The first thing, just like setting the intention for being in the moment, is acknowledging that the value of listening is not something that we really do as a society of culture. When I was preparing for this January series, I started thinking about all the books that exist about the craft of writing. Of course, writing is a big part of my day job at Axios. My bosses just wrote a book about how our style of writing is different. My classes at Calvin surely included the iconic Strunk and White, which I hope is still being taught here. But it made me wonder, what if we gave the same reverence to listening that we do to writing? What if we treated listening just like that, as a skill to be learned, honed, and practiced? What if, for example, the name of Calvin's annual festival wasn't just the Festival of Faith and Writing, but it was the Festival of Faith, Writing, and Listening? So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today, to present a few lessons I've learned from listening. And I should start by acknowledging that while these are lessons I've learned, I'm not saying at all that I do this all the time. That would be a perfect world. But these are some of the things that I try to put into practice, and I'm hoping they can help you too. Many people think that if your job is a broadcast journalist, and if you host a public radio show or a news podcast, that your primary job is talking, not listening. And I would argue that's actually missing the point, because the best interviewers are not the best talkers, they're the best listeners. 
So I'm going to present a few lessons for you here today, but I wanted to start with an exercise that I do when I teach audio journalism classes. In audio, we talk about developing an ear that is actually learning to hear better. And I will be honest and say that like all skills, some people are just naturally better at this than others. But I feel like this is designed to show you how this is something you can learn. So I'm gonna ask us to do an actual full minute of silence. Um, and I know this is gonna be hard to focus during this time, but remember your phones are not near you, so that temptation is gone. And I wanna ask you to listen to the silence. And I'm gonna ask you to report back in a minute what you hear. And don't worry, I'm gonna be timing yourself. So if you can just take a minute and we'll start that now. Okay, so that was a minute, which um, is also, this is a good exercise when I teach audio journalism for people to realize how much you can fit into a minute. Um, and you guys are such a good audience because I can't believe no one coughed during that minute. <laughs> Everyone held it until the end. But can I just ask you, what did you hear? Can you, if people can just shout out, like what did you hear in that silence? You heard your stomach curdling. I love that one. What else? Did someone say God? Great. What else? Breathing. Breathing. So, and then did, the ch did it change? Like, did you feel like you were able to listen better as you kind of went along? Did the silence change? Hey, I see some nodding heads. Um, I ask all of this just to underscore the fact that listening is actually not the same as hearing. For those of us who've never had any incapacities or inability to physically hear, it's easy to confuse the two of these. Because we tend to think that listening and hearing are the same thing, but they're not. And in fact, this is a really important to note for people who may be deaf or hard of hearing, that listening isn't just about the physical act of hearing. As they know, it's about paying attention to what people say, and as I'll talk about later, maybe even what people don't say. As an audio professional, my podcasts are designed to understand that people may be hearing what I'm saying, but they're very likely doing something else. They're probably doing the dishes, or they're driving, or I hear this from my listeners a lot, they're walking their dog, or they're walking themselves. And the odds are, when you're hearing something, you may be calling it listening, but you're not giving it your full attention. And if you're not paying attention, if you're not listening, it's probably not going to register. I'm talking about how people listen to the news or to podcasts, but the reality is people are often not paying 100% attention when they're talking to other people. And maybe it's not possible to focus 100% of your attention on the person in front of you. But what would it look like if the person you were in conversation with became your entire focus? The author Kay Lindell, who's founder of The Listening Center, points out that one of the greatest gifts we can give each other is the gift of our undivided attention of being present, which seems incredibly obvious. One, of course, the best way to listen is to be present, but it's an important place to start to remind yourself of the distractions that we have around us. And if you really want some, to listen to someone and be present, to remove those. I should acknowledge that there are many ways to listen to what someone has to say. Today, I wanna to focus on one type of listening, which is listening to understand what someone's saying. And it's important to think about the fact that we listen for a variety of reasons and ways, as we've already seen so far. There's also something else about you listen, and that's what you hear. And what you hear can depend on what you're listening for. So I think it's important to talk about how you can listen with an open mind. 
I will stop now and say that I'm sure there are at least a few of this, you in this room thinking, how many journalists actually do this? Are they actually having a conversation with someone and listening with an open mind? And I want to say that is a fair point. I believe most independent journalists don't have an agenda other than obtaining the truth. But I think all of us, as humans, have often already decided what someone's going to say before they say it. But if you're really in dialogue with someone, if you're really, truly trying to understand what they're saying, you are listening differently. How does this work, by the way, when you're listening to someone you disagree with? Psychologists who study couples when they fight have estimated that when you're having a conversation with someone and you're disagreeing, some researchers estimate you have about 10 or 15 seconds before your brain gets in the way of being present to what people are saying. <laughs> Let me repeat that. Our brains give us 10 seconds before we go into being defensive, before we stop listening. I am not a psychologist, and I suspect that's an entirely other January series about how to fix that. But I will say, if you think of a conversation not as a debate, not as something you have to win, but actually as a dialogue, that helps. By the way, research shows if you want to change someone's opinion, it does not happen from a debate. And you can think about this. When was the last time you had an argument with someone or a debate and it changed your mind? Given the level of political polarization that we have in this country, I wonder what our conversations with people who we disagree with would look like if we listened. And our goal was simply to understand what they were saying, not to argue or to present your perspective, but simply try to understand what the other person is saying and maybe why they're saying it. And I think this is a really important point in our polarization that we've lost. It's essential, if you're having a conversation with someone you disagree with, that if you understand that listening to what someone is saying doesn't mean you're supporting what they're saying. That's another way I think we conflate or misunderstand listening. And I think it's OK to remember all of this when you're listening to someone and know that when distractions happen, you can just try to work around them. And I think it's OK to say, I do this all the time, can you say that again? Or ask, is this what you're saying? It's also OK when you're listening to someone to get comfortable with a tiny bit of silence. Silence is a journalist's greatest friend, because human nature abhors the vacuum of silence, and often we rush to fill it. But if you learn to get comfortable with pauses and give yourself time to think and slow down, that can also help. Giving yourself permission to be silent is also a way to remind yourself when someone's talking that you're not thinking about what you're going to say next. Or if we're being defensive, hopefully it gives us the space to turn off that mechanism. Which brings me to another lesson. That listening to what someone is saying without you being defensive is an act of humility. I bring up humility because we don't often acknowledge that many conversations have a power dynamic inherent within them. This is especially true in journalism. The summer of 2018, I spent some time with two student journalists from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. They not only survived the horrific school shooting there, they covered the event for their student newspaper, The Eagle Eye. I was going to interview them on stage in front of the annual convention of Asian American journalists which meant they were going to talk about how journalists treated them in a room full of more than 1,000 journalists. Before we talked on stage, I spent quite a bit of time with them off stage. I spent time with them as people and got to know them, and then talked about what we should talk about together on stage. I wanted to be respectful of the trauma that they had gone through, and I was hoping that, that them talking to me would be something that would be helpful and restorative, rather than hurtful or extractive. I share that for a variety of reasons. It's to understand the power dynamic that can be at play between journalists and the people we speak with. Realistically, though, there are very few conversations we're involved with that don't include power dynamics. But it's also to share that everyone, when they're truly sharing something, makes themselves vulnerable. And that vulnerability comes with a variety of risks. People sharing their stories to journalists have had their lives changed and not always for the better. So as a journalist, I've always found it important to acknowledge and honor that. And also, the fact is no one really has to share anything with another person. So when someone does share a part of their story, they're giving you a piece of themselves. My current show at Axios is a podcast. And in general, if I'm not speaking to an elected official, I always start an interview by telling the people I'm talking to two things. First, please stop and correct me if I say something inaccurate. And second, please let me know if there's a question you don't want to answer. The value of many conversations you have is that hopefully you have a basis of trust for them, 
Humility is one of the ways I try to establish trust with people when I first meet them. As a young reporter, one of the other ways I started doing this was dressing like my interview subjects. This becomes very practical and obvious, like when you show up at a farm in a suit, or if you show up in a boardroom and you're not dressed like the CEO. I was living this last week when I was at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland with Axios. There's a very particular style of fashion for meeting with the world's biggest economists, entrepreneurs, and CEOs in a Swiss ski village. Comfortable and shoes adapted for the weather, it also turns out that was also important. But for me, fashion is a very clear way of sending a message about whether you want to look like others or not. And it's also a sign of another lesson, that communication and showing that you're paying attention to someone happens many times without words. Last week, when I was in Switzerland, I was sitting next to one of our video editors, and we were talking about how hard it is for him to edit videos when one person keeps talking over the other person. And I will say that in meetings, I do this all the time. Uh, when I first started hosting, I was also told that I interrupted people too much. My current producer, who has a background in linguistics, tells me that I'm an involved talker, that I'm actually not interrupting people, but that I'm so excited that I'm agreeing and talking to them. She fortunately does this too, which unfortunately makes it very difficult when other less involved talkers join our meetings. But when I first started doing work in public radio as a reporter, there's actually a phrase for this in our industry. It's called talking over your sound. And I learned how to nod very empathetically or to smile or even make grimaces, to show that I'm listening or responding without saying the word. My point is simply that we communicate all the time this way. So I'm not sure if you all were prepared to do an exercise today, but I'm hoping you will indulge me in engaging in a conversation with the person next to you. So I know this is strange, but I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself to the person sitting next to you and just quickly reflect on what's standing out to you today from this talk. And I just wanna give people a few minutes to do this and actually practice about what we've been talking about so far. But a quick reminder. First, it's that listening isn't the same as hearing, but that it's a skill that we need to value and practice. A key way to accomplish this is to be in the moment, to remove distractions and be present. That also means trying to focus on what people are saying and not think about what you're going to say next. But know that silence is your friend and know that communication can happen without words. The key to all of this is, as I've said, humility. And when I talk about humility in this way, it might not be what you think. Yes, it does mean removing your ego, trying to equalize power dynamics as much as you can. But to me, it's also about recognizing the relational aspect that we all have to each other, which is something that I think is very easy to lose sight of these days. This year, I'm doing my third walk through the Ignatian Spiritual Exercises. It's a yearly practice of meditation in scripture. And my spiritual director describes humility as having a stance of openness, respect, and solidarity. This kind of humility recognizes that the individual is simply one person in a web of interconnected relationships and that we're part of a broader society and world. So with that in mind, can I ask you to just engage in a conversation with someone next to you? We're just gonna do this for about three or four minutes and then we're gonna come back. Go ahead. <laughs>
one more minute and then we'll come back. So if we can just do one more minute. everyone's so involved in conversation. This is great. Um, but can I get everyone's attention, please? <laughs> no, this is good that everyone's having conversation. So I just wanted you to do that. And I hope that you will recognize that listening this way feels better for everyone. And that brings me to my final point which is I think when you listen to people this way, when you genuinely try to have an open mind, when you're trying to listen to understand what someone's saying rather than to agree or disagree, that it truly is a gift, not just for that other person, but also for you. One of the concepts that I have discovered this year in my nation studies, which keeps resurfacing in my life again and again this year, is the Hebrew concept of tshuva, which literally means physically turning our bodies toward God. In some Jewish mystical texts, tshuva is a way of healing or repairing a spiritual tear in the very fabric of the universe. I think that whenever we are in the moment, whenever we are truly present, when we see other people by meeting them, we are creating a point of connection and healing. And I think there's something that can be deeply restorative about being with people in this way. Whenever I talk to Calvin students, I often try to underscore the point that if you take anything away from your time at Calvin University, it should be this, the understanding that we are called to do better. We are called to higher standards. And so to the Calvin community today, my charge to you is that we are called to truly try to listen to each other. Thank you. Thank you, Nyla. Thank you. I'm Karen Sapi, Professor Emerita of English, and feeling a little self-conscious as I try to listen and happy. ask questions. <laughs> um, so uh, you can send, you can email questions to askjseries at calvin.edu, and I'll do my best to squeeze them all in. I never remember the name of the man who said this, but I'm always reminded in cases like this of someone who said, being heard feels so much like feeling being loved that most people can't tell the difference. That's beautiful. It's on the internet somewhere. Yeah. You'll find it. I should have put that in my... You yeah, should. Like Look it up. Now you have... Um, what I, I was thinking about, the value of silence, and I'm going to try to allow for some of that this, this afternoon, but um, how do you balance that with the dread of dead space on air? Have you had that problem? Oh, yeah. I played the silence game once, and I lost it very badly. Yeah. <laughs> and most of the time, it doesn't. Most of the time, um, people kind of rush to fill it. But I had one very awkward moment on WBEZ once. Um, I was hosting. I hosted a live afternoon show um, called The Afternoon Shift. And it was, this is, I should have known, because this is when you should also be paying attention. It was like an artist, and I asked him a question about, a colleague who, um, I think he, someone had passed away and we were having a conversation and he was like very adamant that this was like the greatest actor in the history of the world. And I was like, and is it? And he just was like, yes. And then he would, and then I just waited and then he would waited and then I was like, oh, I'm gonna lose this standoff. Um, I'm just gonna have to keep going. So yeah, sometimes that happens and it does. That was it in like 10 years, it's only happened once, so. You talked with students this morning and, and one asked you about how do you formulate a great question? And I want to ask you to tell us basically what you said about the difference between formulating questions for print journalism versus for, for audio, for podcasts or radio. Yeah, so this is something that I learned when I transitioned from starting in print media and then going to audio. When I was um, just concerned about writing what people had to say, I just wanted to get information out of people. Um, and I learned when I became a radio reporter that not only was I trying to get information out of people, I was trying to get it in a way that sounded as good as possible. 
And so rather than just getting information and yes or no, I learned that I had to phrase my questions very differently. And I had to start asking people more open-ended questions. And I had to also um, have people take me to where they were in a moment to describe something, to get a better story out of them. And so it really changed the whole way that I started asking questions of people. Here from a listener asks, have you, have you found certain mindfulness practices that help you be present? And I, I'm going to add in the context of an interview or a story that you're working on. I mean, I would guess I will just say very generally that I think, you know, when we talk about practices like Ignatian spirituality, it's an exercise. And we call them an exercise for a reason, because you literally have to, it is something that you have to train yourself to do. Um, and so one of the things I found this year is I'm just kind of going through a deeper dive into Ignatian spirituality, um, and I'm very intentional about my meditation time, um, that it does kind of change your mindset, right? Like it's, I think all of us know this, if you start your day with prayer or meditation, um, it's a very different thing than if you don't do that. Uh, and so I guess I would just say that I think we should think of all of these things just like we think of physical exercise. And we know what happens like when we don't, when we're sort of out of practice and how we feel. Um, and I think mindfulness is the same. You began your career as a print journalist covering news stories. Do you prefer the context in which you work now where you presumably have more choice about your topics and a little more space for empathy over objectivity or, um, yeah, what's your preference? I would say that, um, I, so I was doing a daily news show up until a couple of months ago. And I think one of the things I'm proudest of with that show was creating moments of empathy in the daily news cycle. I will also say I think that's very difficult. Uh, I was talking to the students about this this morning that I think it's really hard, like we talk about trauma-informed journalism. I think the next conversation that we should also be having, and we are having in some journalism circles, is how traumatized journalists are. Um, journalists are often like, um, you know, we think of how first responders are when they are responding to something. Journalists do that too. Um, you know, like the youngest, unfortunately, and it's always the youngest journalists who are facing the most difficult things. Like if I think about Axios, our breaking news team tends to be our youngest journalists. And they're the ones who are covering school shootings and things on a daily basis. Um, so I do think it's very hard to do that day in, day out. And, um, and I know a lot of journalists that are really having a hard time. Um, I'm grateful that a lot of newsrooms are talking about mental health and taking care of yourself in a way that never happened, um, I think, even five years ago. Um, I will say that I appreciate now that I'm able to... Uh, well, so it's funny, because I feel like 20 minutes is how long my show is. Axios, if you don't know, is like an organization about smart brevity. We do things very quickly. Um, and also, our, our whole premise of the journalism that we do is just because people... We think just because people are busy or don't have a lot of time doesn't mean they're inter not interested in the news. Um, so now that I have like, it feels like 20 whole minutes to have a conversation with someone, it feels like a luxury. And so it is kind of a interesting thing when I go between like my public radio that I'm like doing an interview on 1A, which is 20 minutes or an hour versus my show. But I mean, there's just sort of a different cadence that you adapt to. Sure. Silence. This comes from a listener. What are your thoughts on commiseration in conversation and listening? Um, how much does it help to echo what the speaker is saying? I mean, I think it's always just helpful to acknowledge people's humanity. And I think we lose that a lot, right? And I think journalists, um, I think particularly, I find it very interesting that I think sort of post George Floyd, there's a different acknowledgement in newsrooms about ways people engage with people. Um, and I think one of the things I appreciate at uh, Axios is the idea that we come to work as a full person and that is fully respected. And we are expected to sort of bring our whole person to the job. Um, and I just think a part of that is humanity, right? Like I think that um, I don't think it's compromising. You know, first of all, I think like the idea of objectivity doesn't really exists in journalism anymore. Um, like, I think it's something that we thought was objectivity, which frankly was just whatever the perspective of, of who was in charge before. That was what they thought was objectivity. Um, so I think what we, I try to do now as a journalist is be 
as fair and as accurate as possible and also be as human as possible. And I don't think there's nothing wrong with expressing normal humanity to someone, um, especially if they're, go you know, like I always, you know, I just think it's just, why wouldn't you? You know, like whenever I speak to someone, if they're talking about someone, if there's a death or there's sort of, um, you know, I think you should acknowledge that. I think you should say, I'm sorry for your loss. Like I think, and I think a lot more journalists do that now. Good. I've thought a lot recently about part of what we consider news bias isn't necessarily um, how the facts are reported, but, and I follow a lot of, I try to follow news sources from, from a lot of different perspectives to get this notion, but what I'm noticing more and more is it's not how the story is covered, it's whether the story is covered, what choices networks or news sources, what choices they make about which news is covered and which news is ignored. How much, how much freedom do you have or does Axios give in deciding, say, whether to cover positive or negative aspects of any story? Yeah, I mean, I think we sort of, um, you know, at Axios, we, are, uh, we have a bit of a luxury of not being sort of considered like, you know, like I really feel for, um, you know, if you were to wire service, like my former employers at Reuters or the Associated Press, like they're, the, they're sort of like the journalists of record. Like they don't have a choice, they have to cover everything. Um, I think what we do at Axios is we sort of decide like where we, there are things that we feel like we can add to the conversation where we have expertise. Um, you know, and I think that's one of the things that we found particularly this year, um, Jesse mentioned over the past two years, we've had a bigger expansion into local news. Um, I think the idea is just that we wanna have journalists who are immersed in whatever their area is. Um, and I do feel like at Axios, we do have the sense that if that person is the expert, you know, we sort of trust them to cover things. And of course, we have an entire editorial structure, um, you know, where there are editors and managing editors and our executive editor. Um, but in general, I think um, we, our perspective is our journalists are the experts and we're going to lean on them for whatever their subject matter expertise is. Um, I will say, you know, I think there is such a variety of news sources. Um, that I think that you, and I think this is both great and terrible, that like you can kind of get whatever you want. So I think it's just sort of much more incumbent, and this is the challenge, um, you know, when we talk about news literacy, I think it's just much more incumbent on news consumers to think about, um, to be very objective about thinking about the source of what that news is. Um, and I always encourage people to have a relationship with different news organizations. Like, you should know them. You should know, um, like, what kind of news they cover. You should know what kind of business model they have. Like, how are they funded? Um, what is their objective? Like, what do they say their values are? Um, and I think that, especially as we think about this year and we think about misinformation and we think about what we're going to see um, particularly with artificial intelligence and ways that we know, I mean, look, we know there are people actively, there are bad actors that are actively manipulating um, people and frankly Americans, like during the election. Um, one of the most interesting conversations I had last year was with the director of FEMA. Um, and I asked her what she was most concerned about in the natural disaster space. Um, and I was in Dubai and I was at the UN climate talks and I thought she was gonna say climate change. And she really shocked me because she said she was most concerned about cybersecurity and misinformation. Wow. And she pointed to the fact that like the East Palestine train derailment, the, the wildfires in Maui, we know, latest confirmed that we had Russian and Chinese actors that were actively spreading misinformation in a natural disaster situation to destabilize people there. And so I think we just need to kind of be incumbent upon ourselves as news consumers to know that this is happening and be very informed and educated about the t where you're getting your information from. Oh, these are good questions, everyone. Too many of them. I'll be more brief. What? No, don't, please. What are some useful ways to handle conversations when the listening isn't reciprocated? <laughs> that would happen? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think, I guess I would just say, you know, you have to, everyone has to sort of, you know, you have to make choices in life about how much you're gonna invest in something, right? And I think that's just, I would just give the very practical answer of, you have to decide like how much are you going to invest in this conversation? And sometimes 
you don't, you know, sometimes, I guess I will also say, sometimes it's not being reciprocated for a reason that has nothing to do with you, right? And I think this is another good part of mindfulness and being in the moment. One of my famous, favorite mindfulness exercises is when you think about like how people interpret seeing someone on the street that ignores them. And if you are in a negative space, you're like, that person hates me, what did I do? You know, and if you're just sort of in a much more neutral space, you might think, oh, they're busy. You know, and the reality is, is like that happens all the time. So I would say just sort of take a moment to kind of evaluate the situation and see where to go from there. I, I like the idea of listening just to understand and not to formulate my response because it takes some pressure off. I never think fast. You know, it's the thing where the next day you realize what you should have said. You, yeah, but, it, you, it, but then you could just go back the next day and say that. It's, you're not on a radio right. show. So, like, that's the best thing, right? <laughs> like, I think it's like, All right, I'm going to change the subject. <laughs> you majored at Calvin in philosophy and psychology. Mm -hmm. How did those two majors shape the work that you do as a journalist? Yeah. Um, I had a great conversation with the students about this this morning. You know, I feel like the only philosophy majors you find in journalism are in public radio or podcasting now, um, which I think is not a coincidence. And it, it took me a very long time in journalism before I found other philosophy majors, but they do actually exist. Um, I mean, I think that, as I hope I sort of explained a little bit in my talk, like I think just having the rigorous, um, having a rigorous academic, having the rigorous academic and spiritual formation that Calvin provided me, um, whether that was philosophy, which I found, you know, when I got to graduate school, uh, I was sharing with the students this morning, I felt very insecure about being a Calvin student and being in a room with all of these Ivy League students. And then I realized that I was way ahead of them. I was a philosophy major who was studying international relations at a graduate level, who had already studied Foucault, who knew how to synthesize um, very difficult arguments and write about them. Um, you know, my time as a psychology undergraduate student was also just fairly interesting for me to kind of like dabble in thinking about these things, about how people interact. Um, so, and then as I was also saying, like just the fact that, you know, Calvin was my first experience of a Christian education. I was a public school student before. And having that formation and this space to ask questions um, and have dialogue and to understand and not for it to be about a debate um, was a really important thing for me. Good, good. I'll change the subject again. A couple of our other speakers have, have talked about food and food as being central to community. How do you see listening as being part of meals? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. I mean, I think that, I mean, I think if you look at the way that we even have, I mean, there's something very special about a meal and we know, like, churches know this very well, right? Like, churches are very good at meals and fellowship. Um, in fact, I will say, it's sort of like a joke, when I was in the gospel choir at Calvin, I did it for the food, because we would go to all of these churches and they would feed us, and it was like the best food. Um, I so. have to interrupt and say, I'm glad to hear you say that, because the first thing I did this morning was vacuum my classroom, which had pizza crumbs all over there you go. it from something. Um, so I do think, right, like I think that's also, I think there's an act of food, I suspect, that helps us also be in the moment and helps us remove those distractions. And I think that's why meals are great places to have conversations, right? Because you have sort of a focus, you're eating, you know that you're not really supposed to be on your phone or watching television or doing something else. Um, so when those things are, it's like a much more socially acceptable for us to not have those things going on while we're eating. And so I do think that's where it's like, the, I would say it's probably the, one of the perfect environments for listening and for having a dialogue. Do men listen differently than women? If so, how? Oops. <laughs> that's a great question. I have no idea. Okay. I probably. <laughs> that's um, a safe answer. <laughs> but I am not yet. I was going to say, I'm not, I don't think I'm equipped to answer that at all. OK. <laughs> but, well, here's maybe a related one. Are there biblical characters who were great listeners? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, Jesus, right? Like, I was so interesting. Like, I just um, was just. Um, in my Ignatian exercises, I was just doing the story of the um, Syrophoenician woman who changed Jesus' mind, mm -hmm. right? And she came to Jesus and um, said, I need you to heal my son um, or my child. And he said, you know, he gave this sort of 
kind of perplexing answer that was about like crumbs, which was basically like, I'm here for the Jews, not for you. And, um, and she said, well, even dogs eat the crumbs off the table. And it's just like, it's, you have to go back to the translation because it sounds very strange as I'm saying it to you. But, you know, I was reading one of a translation that was like a modern translation and Jesus's response to her was, good point. Um, and then he healed her daughter, right? And so, like, I think it was like, oh, Jesus was actually listening to her. Um, like, he was engaged in this dialogue, and in the story, he listens to what she says. Actually, this is, like, disproving most of my point, because he changed his mind, but um, he was actually listening. Thank you. From your speech, how was the conversation with the journalism students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School? What did the students and audience learn? And thank you for sharing this story and caring about those students. I think um, what was really interesting was um, the students just sort of shared how the work that they were doing, how some people really accepted it and how some people did it, right? And how they were, in some cases, how they were even, like there was one time, and I just think this is such an important thing, right? Like I think this is, I always say this to journalism students, but I feel like the way people interact with journalists shapes their opinions of them, even when people are other journalists. And in this case, one of the students one day was like treated very badly by a huge national news organization that wanted the subject of her interview. And basically like while she was in the middle of an interview, just like grabbed another student and like was just like, no, we have to do something. Um, so this was like part of my conversations with them was I was like, I think it's fine for you to share that. And I think it's actually really good for you to share it. And you should name the organization. Um, and I was like, and I will back you up. I think it's fine. And it was great because it was like a really good moment in that room. And again, I think this is like part of the conversations I think these students um, were so instrumental and so vocal about saying like, we will not accept this behavior. Um, that I think it did change people's minds. And I think it did change how people thought about things. Um, and it's very easy in the moment, right? Like you're busy, you're trying to get things done. Um, it's very easy, it's, there are very high stress environments. Like it's very easy to behave badly in that situation, but it's just a good reminder why you shouldn't. I think a lot of people view listening and subsequently changing their minds as a weakness. How do we change that as a culture? Mm. I think that comes from a student. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of why we are in the current situation we're in right? Like, we don't want to listen. Like, we don't, like, there's an inability for us to listen to other people's pain and anger. Um, there's an inability for us to sort of engage. Um, you know, the way that when you look at sort of studies, like, the way that we used to feel about race, like, when we have, if you look at polling, Jesse is much better at this. He should, he will know the de demographic, but he will know the stat. But like, the way we used to feel about when someone would say, like, I would bring home, like, my kid would bring home someone from another race to marry, like, this was, like, in the 60s, is how we feel now when someone says, I'm, my child brought home someone who's from another political party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that's a problem, right? Like, I think, as a country, we have to think about the fact that we have formative values that we should all agree on. Um, when it comes to democracy that shouldn't be divided by political party. Um, and I think part of that is like an inability to listen and to hear and to see it as a weakness. I think it's very understandable when we think about what the stakes are, why people are so dug in. But the irony is I think that if we don't find a way out of this, it will sort of become like a worst case scenario. Where do you get your news and what sources do you recommend? So I will say sign up for Axios. <laughs> Just um, so I do like actually this. So I do read a lot of newsletters in the morning. That's my first thing. Um, I actually do read our AM newsletter um, and then a couple of other ones that are sort of like my first source of information first thing in the morning. Um, I actually have notifications off on my phone just because I just can't, like I have the only, I think actually, no, that's true. I have BBC and Axios alerts on, but I actually turned off all other notifications on my phone. Um, and then I try, you know, especially when I'm, especially when I'm at um, WAMU, I feel like I'm sort of like definitely consuming much more NPR content on those days. Um, the BBC is a great source for me for international news as well as Reuters. Um, the Guardian 
um, are kind of, I would say, my, and then I would say in terms of American news organizations, the New York Times and the Washington Post. So I do try to, and then I, um, you know, I kind of just go through, I, most of my social media news consumption comes through Instagram. So um, I would say that um, that would be my main channel. I'm not on X, formerly known as Twitter, anymore. That used to be a big source of news for me. Um, I just feel like it's not palatable to discern where that Maybe information being is coming from. Maybe a bit too much. So I'm not really on that platform anymore. Um, but I would say Instagram is kind of my main social media. Yeah. Can you talk about listening to what people aren't saying? Um, that is what they choose to leave out and what the body language is saying. That doesn't come through in a podcast or the radio, but does it, does it inform how you're shaping your interviews? Yeah, so it doesn't come through, but it, so I, when I interview people, I always like to see them. This is different than other public radio hosts. There are some public radio hosts that do not like to see the people they're interviewing. Um, I like to see them, preferably I like to be in person with them. Um, in the pandemic, we sort of learned that we could do things remotely. Um, so the way I tape my show is that that person is, if they're not in the same room with me, that we're on Zoom together. Um, and the purpose of that is so we can see each other real time. And so while it's harder for me to read body language on Zoom, um, like it's, it still allows for a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, and it still allows, and I think that's an important thing, right? And I think when we think about connection, um, having that simultaneous real-time conversation is very important. Like, we think that, like, texting someone is a connection, but actually it's not. Like, it's not a s simultaneous real-time conversation. And so I think the ability to see someone um, gives you a chance to sort of see how uh, comfortable or uncomfortable they are. Um, I mean, people are, most people are pretty, like, transparent about that, to be honest with you. Like, they, I feel like it's really apparent when someone doesn't want to do, like, answer a question or is uncomfortable or is trying to figure something out. Um, and I will also say that I think this is, like, this is why I love podcasts, this is why I love audio. I think we instinctively as humans can hear this in other people's voices. So we can hear if someone's smiling in their voice. We can hear if someone's about to cry, like we know. Um, and I think that's why audio is such an effective and intimate way of communicating with people. Um, because there's just, if you're paying attention, you kind of know it's gonna happen. You just maybe don't think about it. Um, and so I think I do a lot of that. And I do a lot of, um, I think as I said, like I try to, I have the luxury of doing interviews where they're not necessarily always live, so I can spend a little time with people before. Um, even if it's just for a minute or two, I always try to do that at the beginning of an interview, just like chit chat, just sort of establish, like this is what we're gonna do, this is how long we're gonna talk, this is, you know, just so people kind of understand those things, and I think that helps. Like, it, it again, I think when you have that, it helps form that basis of trust, which then makes like all of those nonverbal cues a little more easier, I think, to read. What was the most challenging or difficult story you ever covered? I would say, um, I would say recently, the Uvalde massacre was very hard for me. Um, I have covered so many um, school shootings, and I'm not necessarily there personally. Um, I'm trying to think if I've actually, thankfully, I don't. For thankfully for me, I don't think I've been in person covering a school shooting on the ground. Um, I would say like that, that was probably the most difficult, like just, um, that was a really hard one. I think that was, that was a time when I just like, that was one of the few times that I just kind of broke down and just really cried and just really like, even I think, I would say not during the interview, but definitely after the interview, and I think I appreciate like our production staff on the show, like we're all very vulnerable with each other. Like when we have those moments, um, we kind of all realize like someone's having a tough time, this is hard. Like, um, and so I ended up just like, this was, I just, what I tried to do after that was just like take a little time. So I just took a couple days off, um, just kind of found ways to sort of like kind of be, um, bring myself back, but that was probably, that would most, in recent memory, I think that was the hardest. And it's very, you know, you just like, 
why did that one hit me more than others? Mm -hmm. I don't really know, but it just did. Um, and then I will say probably the most difficult story I've ever covered in my entire career was the Haitian earthquake. Um, I was in Haiti after the earthquake. Um, some of you know, like I spent, right after my time at Calvin, I spent a year in Haiti teaching um, at a missionary school in Port-au-Prince. Um, my father, my whole life, has run an NGO that was started out of our church in Haiti. Um, and so I have deep ties to that island, and being there after the earthquake was very difficult. Yeah, I would say that was probably the most traumatic thing that I've ever covered. Yeah. Well, on a lighter note, what's the most fun story you've ever covered? <laughs> um, I will say, like, I just, like, what I really enjoy now is just sort of um, just hearing um, people just sort of open up to you, and I really enjoy just, like, when someone, I don't know if it's fun, but I just like, I really enjoy when I have these moments of connection with people. Um, and for me, it's like, I find it incredibly gratifying um, when I have an interview with someone where I feel like I have a real moment of connection. Like, you know, a lot of times journalists, like you get, like people are on book tours or whatever, they're just sort of like saying the same answers over and over again. Um, so for me, I just sort of am, feel very good when I feel like, oh, I really, they actually answered that question. They weren't just like on autopilot. Um, or they shared something that they haven't shared with people before. Um, and I think like one thing that I really enjoy about Axios is we do like have a culture, we do this, like we call it one fun thing, and then we just ask sort of like ridiculous things. And um, I would say the funniest thing I learned lately is that um, Dr. Lori Santos, who's the happiness expert, she does the Happiness Lab podcast, um, she uh, was one of the guests, she was a guest on my show recently, and we were talking to her about burnout and happiness and I, we just said, well, what do you do? And she said, oh, she said, sometimes I just put on Motley Crue and I just rock out. And I was <laughs> like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I think just when I learn something like that about somebody, I yeah. find it fun. Great. Yeah. I'll bet this is a student. Which philosopher would you have enjoyed the potential to interview? Kierkegaard. Why? There we go. Um, I think just because that was such a formative um, philosopher when I was here at Calvin, and I would love to just have a, I think, like, I would love to have a conversation with him now, you know, decades after my time at Calvin about what he really thought, and I think I've probably changed a few things <laughs> in my mind about what I'd want to talk to him. Okay. Uh, well, how do you listen well in a digital world with a digital generation? And you've talked already about turning off the phone. Yeah, and I would say this is, you know, I sort of pick up different things from people that I interview, and I mentioned Dr. Um, Santos. One of the things she said to me, which just kind of blew my mind, I will just share with you all, like what we think of, we really need to think about what we think of connection and what connection is. And, um, you know, when we talk about, like, the very acute mental health crisis that is happening among um, our youngest generations, some of that, I think, has to do with connection and what they think connection is. Uh, and it was so interesting to her, I mentioned this before, but like she was, she pointed out, she was like texting someone is not a form of communication, it's not a connection. Like you're having a conversation with them, it's going off into an ether and then you're responding, like that is not a real time conversation. And it is a way of maintaining perhaps a relationship, but it's not an actual point of connection. And I think there are ways that digital tools can provide great forms of communication. Like you can FaceTime. Like, I mean, I feel like my nieces and nephews who are here and in other universities, like we do that. And I have a real time conversation with them in the moment and they see where I am. And I think the value of that is, you know, my parents are watching right now from Florida, right? Like that's the great part of the virtual world that we live in. Um, but I think it's just important to not mistake that for, it's important to think about what real connection is. Um, and to not think that, um, you know, like a group text is like keeping up a relationship. I, there's an interesting shift from having conversations on the phone to texting instead. There's a safety in that because, because interaction is vulnerable. Real-time interaction is vulnerable. But there's also such beauty in that, right? Mm -hmm. Nyla, thank you for your time with us. Thank you all for being with us and for the great questions. I want to thank our underwriter today who is a friend of the January series. I don't know which one, but thank you. Tomorrow we have climber Tommy Caldwell with us, so I hope you'll all join us again. Thank you all and have a great afternoon. Yeah.